His music is associated with a world without war and the spirit of freedom. Thanks to him, people fell in love with the Liverpool Four. Many people remember the lyrics of his songs, but only a few of them know who John Lennon really was. What childhood traumas did he carry through his life? Why was he mad at Paul McCartney? And how did he meet Yoko Ono? Today, we're going to tell you about all the ups and downs of the charismatic British genius. You're on the Enco Stories channel, and we're starting. John Winston Ono Lennon was born on October 9, 1940 at the Liverpool Maternity Hospital in a working-class family. It was quite a dark time. Europe was in the war, and the boy was born in the middle of it. The parents named the child John Winston Lennon, after his paternal grandfather John Jack Lennon and Prime Minister Winston Churchill. His father was a merchant seaman and was absent from home for a long time, but regularly sent paychecks to 9 Newcastle Road, Liverpool, where his wife and child lived. Suddenly, the checks stopped coming. Alfred went missing in February 1944. When he finally returned home six months later, he offered to look after the family. Julia, by that time, was pregnant with a child from another man and rejected that idea. Parents did not find time to educate the restless, gentle, and talented John. Julia's sister, Mary Elizabeth Mimi Smith, complained twice to Liverpool's social services. Then the boy was fostered by Julia. Aunt Mimi, as John would always call her, carefully raised the boy as her child, but John was still very upset by the separation from both parents. By the age of five, little Lennon had already begun to show his complex character and was expelled from kindergarten after five months. The reason was destructive behavior. In July 1946, John Lennon's father visited Mimi and took his son to Blackpool, intending to secretly immigrate with him to New Zealand. However, Julia followed them, along with her partner, Bobby Dickens. An argument broke out, during which Alfred forced a five-year-old child to choose between his mom and dad. In one version, John Lennon chose his father, but when his mother left, he cried and followed her. But according to Billy Hall, an eyewitness to the quarrel, and, and author Mark Louison, the story was slightly embellished. However, since then, John had not seen his father for 20 years. He spent much of his childhood and youth in Woolton with Aunt Mimi and her husband, George Toogood Smith, who had no children. An aunt bought volumes of stories for John, and an uncle, a milkman on the family farm, worked with the boy on crossword puzzles. Once, he bought him a harmonica. That's how music appeared in the life of young Lennon. Julia regularly visited her son, who in turn often came to her at 1 Blomfield Road, Liverpool. There, she played Elvis Presley records to John and taught him how to play the banjo. One of the songs she showed was Ain't That a Shame by Fats Domino. There were five women that were my family. Five strong, intelligent, beautiful women. Five sisters. One happened to be my mother. She just couldn't deal with life. She was the youngest and she had a husband who ran away to sea and the war was on and she couldn't cope with me and I ended up living with her elder sister. Now those women were fantastic. John was brought up as an Angelican and went to Dovedale Primary School. After passing the 11-plus exam, he attended Quarry Bank High School in Liverpool, where he studied from 1952 to 1957. It was a strict school that did not suit the freedom-loving John. During those years, Lennon was remembered as a happy-go-lucky, good-humored, easy-going, lively lad. In the classroom, he did everything but not study. He often drew funny cartoons of teachers and students that appeared in the school magazine, The Daily Howl, and wrote poetry and humorous stories. In his free time, the boy regularly visited his cousin Stanley Parks, who lived in Fleetwood, and took him to local cinemas. During school days, Parks visited Lennon with Layla Harvey, another boy's cousin, and the three of them often traveled to Blackpool two or three times a week to watch the show. While visiting Blackpool Tower Circus, they observed such artists as Dickie Valentine, Arthur Askey, Max Bygraves, and Joe Loss. John especially liked George Formby. In 1956, Julia helped John to buy his first guitar. It was an inexpensive Galatone Champion Acoustic, for which she loaned her son five pounds and ten shillings. There was the condition that the guitar would be delivered to her home and not to Mimi's, knowing that her sister did not support her son's musical aspirations. Mimi was skeptical of his claims that he would one day be famous and hoped he would get bored with the music, often telling him, the guitar is all very well, John, but you'll never make a living out of it. In June 1955, Uncle George died of a liver hemorrhage. It was a blow for the boy, but an even greater shock came three years later when, in July 1958, Julia Lennon was hit by a car on her way home from the Smith's house. 
Such circumstances were not uncommon after the Second World War. It aroused anger in John Lennon, which he sublimated with pain and difficulty into an acute need for human communication. The death of his mother deeply traumatized John, and for the next two years, he drank heavily and often got into fights consumed by a blind rage. He pestered everyone, but getting a fitting rebuff, he got into a fight with weaker guys. The memory of his mother would later serve as an inspiration for Lennon's work, even inspiring him to write the Beatles' 1968 song, Julia. In high school, John's behavior changed considerably. Quarry Bank High School teachers said of him, he has too many wrong ambitions and his energy is often misplaced. And his work always lacks effort. He is content to drift instead of using his abilities. The guy's bad behavior led to a small split in relations with the aunt. John failed O-level exams, but he was not allowed to work. He was admitted to the Liverpool College of Art only after a conversation between Aunt Mimi and the principal. In college, he began wearing teddy boy clothes. Also, he could be expelled for his behavior. I come from the macho school of pretense. I was never really a street kid or a tough guy. I used to dress like a teddy boy and identify with Marlon Brando and Elvis Presley, but I never really was in real street fights or real down-home gangs. I was just a suburban kid imitating the rockers, but it was a big part of one's life to look tough. According to Cynthia Powell, Lennon's classmate and wife, he was thrown out of the college before his final year. Many years later, in an interview, John would say about that dark period that he spent the whole of his childhood with shoulders up around the top of his head and his glasses off because glasses were sissy and walking in complete fear, but with the toughest looking face ever seen. I'd get into trouble just because of the way I looked. I wanted to be this tough James Dean all the time. It took a lot of wrestling to stop doing that. Even though I still fall into it when I get insecure and nervous, I still drop into that I'm a street kid stance, but I have to keep remembering that I never really was one. John was a boorish bully and did not know what to do in life, but one thing would enchant him and help him decide. At 15, he formed a musical group, the Quarrymen, named after Quarry Bank High School. Founded in September 1956, within six months, the band was performing a spirited set of songs consisting of half skiffle and half rock and roll. Skiffle is a genre of folk music with influences from blues, jazz, and American folk music, often using homemade instruments and created at home. I said, are we ready to do this? Yeah. 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 Good. Then, in the summer of 1957, John and his team performed at St. Peter's Church Garden Fete. John played his guitar and sang. Eric Griffiths was the second guitarist. Colin Hanton played the drums. Rod Davis played the banjo. Pete Shotton used a washboard to play his part, and Lynn Gary played bass. According to legend, created from a chest in which people kept tea. First, they played in the back of a moving truck in a procession led by the band of the Cheshire Yeomanry. And in the evening, they were supposed to perform on stage. It was only the second performance of the Quarrymen at Woolton where John met Paul McCartney. Soon, they would become a strong creative duet as part of the group and would sign their musical works Lennon-McCartney for a long time. Years later, Lennon and McCartney's songwriting partnership is still considered one of the most influential and successful of the 20th century. But let's not be hasty. Paul was impressed with John because he was a couple of years older and didn't seem to care about anything at all. He smelled of rebelliousness and beer. The guys got to know each other and McCartney showed Lennon a performance of Eddie Cochran's 20 Flight Rock, Gene Vincent's Be Babalula, and a medley of Little Richard songs. He went before the start of the evening show. After the show, John chatted with friends and decided to invite Paul to join the group. I remember Paul coming along that night at St. Peter's Church Hall, picking up a guitar, I didn't even know he was left-handed, and playing a couple of chords. I think he was trying to audition for us. Two weeks later, Shotton met McCartney cycling through Woolton and extended him Lennon's invitation to join the Quarrymen. Soon, the musician made his debut with the group at a party of the Conservative Club. By that moment, Shotton and Davis had left the band as it moved more and more away from the skiff into a rock direction. According to McCartney, Aunt Mimi was very aware that John's friends were lower class and often patronized him when he came to visit Lennon. Paul's father disapproved of John, stating that Lennon would get his son in trouble. However, he allowed the young band to rehearse in the family living room. During that time, John wrote his first song, Hello Little Girl, which in 1963 would become a top 10 hit in the UK, The Foremost. John Lennon found friends who helped him cope with difficulties. 
find himself and start his musical career. The first Quarrymen concerts would quickly become something unexpectedly big for John and the company. George Harrison, whom McCartney recommended to Lennon and John's art school friend Stuart Sutcliffe, soon joined the team. By the way, it was Sutcliffe who influenced Lennon's internal changes. At some point, John began to read a lot, especially the American beatnik writers that became popular in Britain. He began to pay more attention to his studies, and the Italian artist Amadeo Modigliani became his new hero, along with Elvis. Sutcliffe would become one of the main inspirations for the work of John and their group. Of all the people who surrounded the guy in the early 60s, John considered Sutcliffe as a close friend. Stewart was a talented artist and was destined to become the second Picasso. He was in the Liverpool Bohemian crowd, and his paintings regularly appeared at contemporary art exhibitions. John was drawn to that world since he was interested in art and literature. However, he was still a simple street kid from the working outskirts of the city. John negatively influenced Stewart, sometimes dragging his friend into drunken brawls and pubs. Nevertheless, Lennon persuaded Sutcliffe to use the royalties from one of his paintings to buy a bass guitar and join the band. So John Lennon, along with McCartney, Harrison, and Sutcliffe became The Beatles in early 1960. The idea for the name belonged to Sutcliffe. He wanted the group to be called the Silver Beatles, but John suggested doing The Beatles through A, so the word beat was also read in the name. The Beatles were invited to a 48-day residency in Hamburg, West Germany, in August of the same year. The band actively searched for a drummer and found him in Pete Best, who successfully fit in the band. John's aunt, who found out about that trip, was worried and begged Lennon not to go and continue studying art. By 1960, Hamburg, rising from the ruins of World War II, had earned a reputation across Europe as a city of vice and criminal activity. Unlike the economically depressed post-war Liverpool, Hamburg was a wealthy city, but it was hard to influence Lennon's decision. Nobody controls me. I'm uncontrollable. The only one who controls me is me, and that's just barely possible. John decided to go anyway, and ended up spending two and a half years there until December 1962, playing regularly in various clubs in Hamburg. There were Indra Club, Kaiser Keller, Top 10 Club and the Star Club. The first 48-day residence flowed into the second and then into the third, which allowed the guys to hone their performing skills, improve their reputation, and play perfectly together. As a result, John, Paul, and George understood each other with a smile or a nod. As a result, after the trip, the group would record their first album, thereby attracting the attention of businessman Brian Epstein, the future Beatles manager. In the meantime, in Hamburg, the group played American rock and roll every night in small clubs, slept in dressing rooms, and went to the toilet to the cinema across the street. In addition, along with other group members, in Hamburg, Lennon met with Preludin. It was the drug that he regularly took as a stimulant during their long nights of performances. The guy's relationship also did not stand still. At the age of 21, John married his girlfriend from college, Cynthia Powell. She often accompanied him to the band's first shows and traveled to Hamburg with McCartney's girlfriend to visit him. Although, at first, Cynthia was frightened by the behavior and appearance of Lennon. When she found out that he was obsessed with the French actress Bridget Bardot, she dyed her hair blonde. John asked her out, but when she said she was engaged, he yelled, I didn't ask you to f***ing marry me, did I? Lennon was jealous and became possessive over time, often frightening Powell with his anger. In her 2005 memoir, John, the girl recalled that when they were dating, a guy hit her after he saw her dancing with Sutcliffe. After that, the girl broke off the relationship, but three months later, John asked for forgiveness. They reunited. From then, he could be verbally harsh and rude to Powell, but never used force again. Over time, Lennon admitted that he never questioned his chauvinistic attitude towards women until he met Yoko Ono. I used to be cruel to my women, and physically, any woman. I was a hitter. I couldn't express myself, and I hit. I fought men, and I hit women. That is why I am always on about peace. In July 1962, John found out that Cynthia was pregnant and insisted on getting married. The couple got married on the 23rd of August, with Brian Epstein serving as best man. Their marriage took place when uncontrollable love for the group Beatlemania was gaining momentum throughout the UK. 
Epstein was afraid that fans would be disappointed by the married Beatles member and therefore asked the Lennons to keep their marriage a secret. On April 8, 1963, John and Cynthia had a son, Julian. The musician was on tour, therefore he saw the baby only three days later. The group flourished because Sutcliffe laid the creative intellectual foundation for John and the other Beatles. And over time, that would help the group evolve from just a talented boy band into a complex phenomenon in the world of art. Brian Epstein, who had been managing the band since 1962 and had no previous band management experience, had a strong influence on the band's dress code and attitude towards the stage. John initially resisted the imposition of the trappings of a professional scene, but eventually complied, saying, I'll wear a bloody balloon if someone's going to pay me. So the band underwent some changes, including the lineup. Sutcliffe decided to stay in Hamburg while he met his love, and Paul McCartney took his place. Instead of Pete Best, Ringo Starr sat on the drums. Thus, the final composition of The Beatles was formed, which would last eight years and bring them worldwide fame. Interestingly, John often used pseudonyms throughout his musical career, especially in the early days. For example, he owns such names as Dr. Winston O'Boogie, Booker Table, Dwarf McDougall, Rev. Fred Gherkin, the Honorable John St. John Johnson, Joel Non, and Captain Kundalini. Meanwhile, John continued to correspond with Sutcliffe. During that period, Stewart's health deteriorated. He had headaches, insomnia, and bouts of nausea. Over time, his notes and drafts would be found revealing the significance of Lennon's support and their correspondence to Sutcliffe. The artist's health problems were also described there, unexpectedly for everyone, especially for John. On April 10, 1962, Stuart Sutcliffe died. The cause was a brain hemorrhage. Lennon found out about that when the Beatles arrived in Hamburg a few days later to open a new music venue, the Star Club. The news sounded like a bolt from the blue to John, and he struggled to keep his composure. Stuart's wife, Astrid Kirker, wrote in a letter to his mother, Oh, Mum, he, Lennon, is in a terrible mood now. He just can't believe that darling Stuart never comes back. He's just crying his eyes out. John is marvelous to me. He says that he knows Stuart so much and he loves him so much that he can understand me. Having played a night concert with the group after, he finally gave vent to his feelings. At the after party, Lennon got very drunk and did not watch his language, speaking rudely to everyone. He was shocked and distressed, feeling the echoes of his past sufferings after the loss of his mother. The loss of his best friend meant a lot to him. He had no one else to share his wildest ideas and get answers on how to implement them. But as usual, the dark stripe was followed by the light one. The group's first single, Love Me Do, was released on October 1962 and reached number 17 on the UK charts. On February 11th of the next year, the Beatles recorded their debut album, Please Please Me. In addition to the previous singles, the work on the album at Emmy Studios took less than 10 hours, although John was suffering from the effects of a cold at that time. We can hear it in the vocals on the last song recorded that day, Twist and Shout. John Lennon and Paul McCartney co-wrote eight songs on the album, except for some titles, one of which was the album title. Lennon had yet to bring his love of wordplay to his lyrics, saying, We were just writing songs. Pop songs with no more thought of them than that. To create a sound, and the words were almost irrelevant. Many years later, Paul McCartney would say in an interview that the other Beatles members idolized Lennon. He was like our own little Elvis. We all looked up to John. He was older, and he was very much the leader. He was the quickest wit and the smartest. The album was released on March 22nd and produced by George Martin, who worked with the band so passionately and diligently that he had a nickname, The Fifth Beatle. The record topped the record retailer's LP chart for 30 weeks, an unprecedented feat for a pop album at that time. And the single Please Please Me reached number one on the NME and Melody Maker charts. With their debut album, the band achieved mainstream success in Britain and went on tour. John was never really at a loss for words, so during the Royal Variety Show performance, which was attended by the Queen Mother and other British royalty, Lennon poked fun at the audience. For our next song, I'd like to ask you for your help. For the people in the cheaper seats, clap your hands. And the rest of you, if you'll just rattle your jewelry. After the year of Beatlemania in the UK, in February 1964, the band's debut performance in the United States at the Ed Sullivan Show became historic and marked the beginning of world fame. Two years of constant touring were accompanied by writing new songs and filming a movie. 
During that time, John wrote two books, in his own right and a Spanish in the works. The first was a book of nonsense consisting of his author's illustrations, poems, and stories ranging in length from eight lines to three pages. John only showed some of his writings and drawings to journalist Michael Brown, but he demonstrated them to Tom Mashler of publisher Jonathan Cape. As a result, in January 1964, Lennon signed a contract with the publisher. The book contained much of the group's personal meanings and inside jokes. It also alluded to John Lennon's preoccupation with physical disabilities and expressed his anti-authority sentiments. His writing style was shaped by his infatuation with English writer Lewis Carroll, while humorists Spike Milligan and Professor Stanley Unwin inspired his sense of humor. The book's illustrations emulated the style of cartoonist James Thurber. The book was critically acclaimed and had impressive commercial success. 300,000 copies were sold just in the UK. Critics also praised the wordplay in the text and laudatory comparisons with the later works of James Joyce. The second book was published in June 1965 and consisted of works and drawings similar to the previous one in style without any meaning. He wrote it during the last touring year and the title was a play on words from a spanner in the works. The book was less successful than the first. 100,000 copies were sold in the first three months. Books released at the height of Beatlemania solidified the public perception of Lennon as the smart one of the Beatles and helped further legitimize pop musicians' place in the culture of society. In the summer of 1964, the musical comedy film directed by Richard Lester, A Hard Day's Night, was released. He's right, you know. There you go. Filmed at the height of Beatlemania, the film showed 36 hours of the band's life as they prepared for their TV show. The movie was a commercial success. Fans warmly welcomed it. Critics had cited the film's impact because it directly led to all the kaleidoscopic London spy thrillers and comedies of the late 60s. There were many moments during filming. George Harrison, in one scene, accidentally tore his suit, and John Lennon, giving a girl reporter a written answer to the question, if he has any hobbies, wrote the word boobs. Also, there was his first meeting with his father in 17 years on one of the shooting days. Alfred Lennon arrived at the band's manager's office. Brian Epstein sent a car for John, but the first guy's words at the meeting were, What do you want? And the meeting lasted no more than 20 minutes. Then an angry John told him to get out. A year later, the second Richard Lester project with the Beatles was released. Help was a musical comedy adventure film about the band's struggles to record their new album. In parallel, they try to protect Ringo Starr from a sinister cult and a pair of mad scientists while they were obsessed with getting one of his rings. The film had its royal world premiere at the London Pavilion Theatre in the West End of London, in the presence of Princess Margaret, Countess of Snowdon, and the Earl of Snowdon. Commercially, the film was still successful, although it appealed to a smaller number of people. Some claimed that he influenced the development of music videos, Following the film's release, the band released its soundtrack as their self-titled fifth studio album. Help, I need somebody. Help. In the same year, the Beatles received recognition from the British establishment. The Liverpool Four were awarded the members of the Order of the British Empire and the 1965 Queen's Birthday Honours. By that time, the band had become insanely popular with more and more fans. Lennon was concerned that fans attending Beatles concerts could not hear the music due to the crowd's screams. As a result, they had to play a little louder, but musicality suffered from it. The title track from the album Help expressed John's personal feelings in 1965. He recalls, I meant it. It was me singing Help. Then, because of the worries, he gained weight, which he would later talk about as his fat Elvis period. John felt that he was subconsciously seeking changes. In March of the same year, Lennon and Harrison, not on their own fee, took LSD. One evening, a dentist who hosted a dinner party which was attended by musicians with their wives put the drug in the guest's coffee. At the time, the mind-altering drug was still legal and the public remained unaware of its existence. As the boys got ready to leave, the dinner organizer revealed what they had taken and strongly advised them not to leave the house due to the intended consequences. Later in the nightclub elevator, they were convinced that it was on fire. Lennon recalled, We were all screaming, hot and hysterical. The personality of John Lennon, despite the popularity of the Beatles, stood apart and stood out from the background of other band members. All the Beatles' creative successes and victories played into the hands of John. On the contrary, any of his statements and precedents did not affect the group's reputation in the best way. 
In March 1966, during an interview with Evening Standard reporter Maureen Cleave, Lennon remarked, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. The comment was unnoticed in England, but caused great outrage in the U.S. when a local magazine quoted it five months later. The subsequent furor, which included the burning of Beatles records, the activities of the Ku Klux Klan, and threats against Lennon contributed to the band's decision to stop performing in America. After the band's last concert on August 29, 1966, John starred in Richard Lester's anti-war black comedy, How I Won the War, based on Patrick Ryan's 1963 novel of the same name. Lennon had just taken a break from the Beatles and was invited by Richard Lester to play the role of musketeer Gripweed in the film. It was his first and last non-musical role. To prepare for it, John had his hair cut and the new hairstyle contrasted sharply with his mop-top haircut look. During filming, he began to wear round granny glasses, the same ones worn by the screenwriter of the film, Charles Wood. Standard glasses for the short-sighted. According to Paul McCartney, Lennon was blind as a bat, but thanks to filming with glasses, finally, he was able to see freely and not worry about his appearance. He mostly wore that particular style of glasses for the rest of his life, although they were far from trendy. Now, they've become iconic and are known as John Lennon glasses. A photograph of Lennon as grip weed appeared in many print publications, including the front page of the first issue of Rolling Stone magazine in November 1967. The Spanish location for filming was boring for John, so Ringo Starr came to keep him company. However, working on the project was finally a refreshing change in Lennon's increasingly challenging and isolated musical career with the Beatles. Now he was just another cast member on set, a relatively minor one who could interact like a normal person with the crew and others. So Lennon insisted on visiting the filming set every day as a learning experience, even if he wasn't needed there. While in Almeria, John rented a villa, Santa Isabel, which he and his wife Cynthia Lennon shared with his co-star Michael Crawford and his wife Gabrielle Lewis. The wrought iron gates and the surrounding lush vegetation of the villa reminded John of Strawberry Field, a Salvation Army garden not far from his childhood home. It inspired Lennon to write the song Strawberry Fields Forever during filming. In November of 66, John returned to his bandmates for an extended recording of new material. Lennon became seriously addicted to LSD, and according to British music critic and writer Ian MacDonald, his permanent drug use in 1967 brought him close to erasing his identity. Lennon himself explained it. LSD was the self-knowledge which pointed the way. I was suddenly struck by great visions when I first took acid, but you've got to be looking for it before you can possibly find it. Perhaps I was looking without realizing it. Perhaps I would have found it anyway. It would have just taken longer. Soon the single Strawberry Fields Forever was released, which was noted by Time magazine for its astonishing inventiveness. Strawberry Fields Forever. The album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band became the group's iconic and very successful record. 27 weeks at number one on the record retailer chart in the United Kingdom, and 15 weeks at number one on the Billboard Top LP chart in the United States. Critics noted the innovative approach to songwriting. John Lennon's lyrics contrasted strongly with the simple love songs of the band's early years. Do you think drugs influenced the development of the group's creativity? Or did they become such a legendary band by simply studying music? Write your opinion in the comments. We read all of them. The summer of 1967 was special for the group and the whole world. People were already pretty tired of wars. Remembering the Second World War, which had recently died out, humanity witnessed the Vietnam War, which lasted for several years. Then, society was looking for ways to end that conflict and tell the world that war was not an option. War was terrible, and instead of war, you needed to show your love. That's how Summer of Love happened. A social phenomenon brought together about 100,000 young people who shared the fashion and hippie views and gathered in San Francisco's neighborhood of Haight-Ashbury. Their movement included music, hallucinogenic drugs, and anti-war sentiment, and free love, and spread across the west coast of the United States to New York City. All you need is love. By that time, John Lennon had written the song All You Need Is Love, performed by the Beatles for the Our World satellite broadcast. 
The total number of viewers was up to 400 million people worldwide. The song deliberately expressed a pacifist position in simple words. It immediately became the Summer of Love anthem. After that, LSD use decreased, and on August 26, the group publicly denounced the drug, instead declaring their belief in the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi system of transcendental meditation. The group even attended a personal training weekend in August, the Transcendental Meditation Seminar in Bangor, Wales. However, Lennon returned to the hallucinogenic world a few times a year as he searched for a way to reset his mind and calm inner demons while providing the world with great music. The group found out about Brian Epstein's death during a workshop in Bangor. It was another blow for the Beatles, but not so strong for Lennon, who had already experienced several losses. Later in an interview, he recalled that period as, I knew we were in trouble then. I didn't have any misconceptions about our ability to do anything other than play music. I was scared. I thought, we f***ing had it now. By that time, Lennon's aggressive personality, which had arisen in his childhood, disappeared, and he spent considerable time sitting in his solarium or the garden, daydreaming for hours. He became a bit uncommunicative towards people, including Cynthia, apart from the others from the Beatles, who had an almost unspoken ability to understand each other. Cynthia once complained to John, saying she wished we had a holiday, John, Julian, and me, to which Lennon replied, Okay, I know, we'll all retire to a little cottage on a cliff in Cornwall, alright? No, I've got these bloody songs to write. I have to work to justify living. Cynthia understood his temperament, but felt frustrated that she had never developed her career. John still loved Cynthia and his son, but gradually moved away from the family due to work on songs for the new album. In February 1968, the Beatles went to Maharishi's ashram in India. Lennon had a personal interest. Arriving there, they wrote most of the songs for their new album, which would also be the only double album the Beatles, or as it was also called by the masses, White Album. In anticipation of the band's trip to India, Cynthia found John's correspondence with Yoko Ono. They met at the London Indica Gallery in 1966, where Ono was preparing for an exhibition of her work. John was skeptical about concept art, but her exhibition intrigued him. Since then, they have been in contact. Lennon denied a connection to Ono, claiming that she was just a crazy artist looking for sponsors, although she made a flood of calls and visits to Kenwood. In India, he demanded a separate bedroom for himself, explaining that he could only meditate in solitude, and went every morning to check the mail from Yoko that came daily. After returning to Kenwood from India, Lennon drank on the plane and confessed to Cynthia about his connections with, quote, thousands of women around the world. Cynthia tried to support Lennon to the end, and sometime later, returning earlier than planned from a vacation from Greece, Cynthia found John and Yoko Ono sitting on the veranda in a lotus position in bathrobes. All that was the reason for the couple's divorce, which was formalized in November of the same year. As a result of the divorce, Cynthia received £100,000, another £2,400 a year, and help with Julian's maintenance. At the same time, members of the group were involved in the creation of the multimedia corporation Apple Corps, insisting of Apple Records and several other subsidiaries. John called it an attempt to achieve artistic freedom in the business structure. However, the band's debut single for the Apple label, released during the 68 protests, included Lennon's Revolution. The song's pacifist message drew ridicule from political radicals in the press. Released in November, the record became a multi-genre breakthrough, including such genres as folk, British blues, ska, music hall, pre-heavy metal, and the avant-garde. Thanks to that, critics recognized it as postmodern and one of the greatest albums of all time. However, the transcendental meditation experience influenced the camaraderie within the band during the recording of the album. Back at the studio in London, disputes broke out between the four due to creative differences and John's new partner, Yoko Ono. Escalating tensions in the Beatles' recording sessions, Lennon insisted on having his new girlfriend by his side. The constant presence of the girl undermined the Beatles' policy of excluding wives and girlfriends from the studio. In December, John Lennon participated in a concert show organized by the Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stones' Rock and Roll Circus. He performed alongside Yoko Ono as part of a one-time supergroup called the Dirty Mac, which included Eric Clapton, Mitch Mitchell, and Keith Richards. 
During that performance, John met the manager of the Rolling Stones, Alan B. Klein, and has since pushed for him to be the manager of the Beatles. We were impressed by the way he handled the business deals for the Rolling Stones. Besides, he has some of the cleanest polo neck sweaters I've ever seen. He's the only businessman I've met who isn't gray right through the eyes to the soul. Klein's candidature was not approved only by McCartney, who never signed a management contract. Klein made an immediate impact on Apple, cutting budgets, firing unproductive employees, and establishing a professional atmosphere within the company. However, Ringo Starr left the band for two weeks in August after several problems. The same tensions would continue over the next year and lead to the band's breakup. My role in society, or any artist's or poet's role, is to try and express what we all feel. Not to tell people how to feel. Not as a preacher. Not as a leader. But as a reflection of us all. On March 20th, 1969, John Lennon and Yoko Ono got married. They soon released 14 lithographs called Bag One, depicting scenes from their honeymoon. Eight of them were considered undecent, and most were banned and confiscated altogether. Lennon's creative focus continued to go beyond the Beatles. Between 1968 and 1969, he and Ono recorded three albums of experimental music, Unfinished Music No. 1, Two Virgins, better known for its cover art than its music, Unfinished Music No. 2, Life with the Lions, and Wedding Album. In 1969, they formed the Plastic Ono Band, realizing Live Peace in Toronto in 1969. Releasing Live Peace in Toronto in 1969. The couple actively called for an end to the Vietnam War. In that short period, John released the singles Instant Karma, Give Peace a Chance, which was welcomed as an anti-war anthem, and Cold Turkey, in which the musician documented his withdrawal symptoms after becoming addicted to heroin. When it gets down to having to use violence, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard, flick your face to make you fight. Because once they've got you violent, then they know how to handle you. The only thing they don't know how to handle is nonviolence and humor. John changed quite noticeably. He began to speak out more actively on all kinds of topics. It was hard not to notice Ono's influence on him. Because of Britain's involvement in the Nigerian Civil War, its support for America in the Vietnam War, and jokingly, because of the Cold Turkey song, which became less listened every day, Lennon decided to return his MBE medal to the Queen. However, it did not affect his MBE status, which cannot be abandoned. Lennon left the Beatles in September 1969. There were several reasons. The death of manager Brian Epstein, John's relationship with Ono, and resentment towards McCartney from his bandmates as he wanted more power. John was also outraged that Paul McCartney left the group only after the solo album release to whet the appetite. In an interview the following year, he expressed his sadness over the band's breakup, talking about the band's members' negative attitude towards Ono, and once again offending Paul. Me, Harrison, and Starr got fed up with being sidemen for Paul. After Brian Epstein died, we collapsed. Paul took over and supposedly led us, but what is leading us when we went round in circles? From April to September 1970, Lennon and Ono underwent primary therapy with Arthur Janov at Tittenhurst in London and at Janov's clinic in Los Angeles. The therapy aimed to relieve the emotional pain of John's early childhood, including two days a week with Janov for six months. In December of the same year, John released his debut solo album, John Lennon Slash Plastic Ono Band. The critics warmly welcomed the album, but the harsh sound and purely personal lyrics negatively affected its commercial success. The album included the song Mother, in which Lennon confronts his feelings of rejection as a child. The composition Working Class Hero looked like a violent attack on the bourgeoisie system of society because of the line, You're still f***ing peasants. However, John sought commercial success and simplified the sound of his next album. That is how the iconic Imagine appeared. Lennon and Ono moved to New York in August 71 when the album work ended. The audience warmly welcomed the sound. The lyrics touched on topics such as peace, love, politics, Lennon's experience in therapy, and even attacking Paul McCartney in the song How Do You Sleep, after a period of intense personal tension. Imagine reached number one on the UK Albums Chart and the US Billboard 200. It was regarded as one of Lennon's best solo albums, and over time, the album title track would become the worldwide anthem of the anti-war movements performed to that day. You may say I'm a 
We should also mention Jealous Guy, in which John addressed his past degrading treatment of women, admitting that his behavior was the result of long-standing insecurity and vulnerability. After moving to New York, the star couple almost immediately took up the left-wing radical politics of the United States. John and Yoko recorded the Christmas song, Happy Christmas, War is Over, which was also a protest against the Vietnam War. It was the culmination of more than two years of anti-war activity by Lennon and Ono, which began with mass protests organized by them in the spring of 1969. Their honeymoon consisted of it. During the New Year holidays, President Nixon's administration took a so-called strategic countermeasure against Lennon's anti-war and anti-Nixon propaganda. Over the next four years, the administration would try to deport the musician. Lennon was embroiled in an ongoing legal battle with the immigration authorities, and in 1976, they denied his permanent residence in the United States. And I don't think that half the people that were started it are now having their own problems, <laughs> right? So, I don't know where I am. I know there's a different lot of people in charge of my case now, and I'm sure they're not as hot to get me out because they, they didn't even have the Republican convention in San Diego, and I was not committed to go there either. Mm -hmm. During that time, John Lennon continued to write songs and released the album Sometime in New York City, which was a failure. Songs about women's rights, race relations, Britain's role in Northern Ireland, and Lennon's difficulty in obtaining a green card were negatively welcomed by critics. They said John was a pathetic, aging revolutionary. Unexpectedly for him, the glory and popularity had passed, and difficult times began. By early 1973, John Lennon began to distance himself from the political and social issues he'd been dealing with for the previous year and a half. At that time, he and his wife Yoko Ono had family problems. John wanted to rehabilitate himself after the failed album. While in his flat, John began composing music after almost a year of break. He often appeared in court, trying to defend his right to be in the States. Soon, Lennon began to experience severe stress. The situation only worsened due to the constant surveillance of the musician by FBI agents due to his political activity. I just couldn't function, you know? I was so paranoid from them tapping the phone and following me. A combination of factors caused John to become emotionally withdrawn. To somehow distract himself, he began to write songs for his album Mind Games. The work was so relaxing that he wrote all the songs in a week. John created the album cover himself, cutting out the photos by hand. The front and back covers were identical. On the back side, Lennon was closer to the foreground, symbolizing his symbolic departure from Ono and her apparent disproportionate influence on him. Before recording the album, John's relationship with Ono finally deteriorated, and the girl insisted on breaking them up. However, the album received mixed reviews upon release. In America, the record took only ninth place in the charts, and his native UK, Mind Games, did not reach the top 10, taking 13th. John himself would later describe the album as, The Mind Games single is fine, but there's just no energy to sustain through the album and there's no clarity of vision. The cover says more than the record to me. After Lennon and Ono broke up in the fall of 1973, he spent over a year drinking and writing music in Los Angeles. He spent that year and a half with May Pang, but their relationship would not result in anything. John would call that period of his time Lost Weekend, referring to the film of the same name. In early 1974, John drank heavily and his usual antics and rowdy demeanor returned. A couple of those alcohol-fueled moments made headlines. In March, at the Troubadour Club, John stuck an unused minstrel pad to his forehead and got into a fight with a waitress. Two weeks later, in the same club, Lennon and Harry Nielsen fought with the Smothers Brothers. As a result, they were thrown out into the street. Nevertheless, new songs continued to be released, and John Lennon even collaborated with Elton John and David Bowie. Both compositions, for some time, occupied the first place in the charts. By February 1975, the couple reunited. Soon, Lennon and Ono had a son. The boy was named Sean. He was born on October 9, 1975, on Lennon's 35th birthday. John's joy was hard to imagine. He immediately took on the role of a householder. The artist abruptly moved away from music, leaving Ono to decide all the affairs, and practically became a recluse. 
As he would later say in one interview, for five years he baked bread and looked after the child. He dedicated himself to Sean, getting up every day at 6 a.m. to plan and cook meals and spend time with him. John officially announced his break from music in Tokyo in 1977. We have basically decided without any great decision to be with our baby as much as we can until we feel we can take time off to indulge ourselves in creating things outside of the family. During a break in his career, he created several series of drawings and prepared a book containing a mixture of autobiographical material and what he called mad stuff. However, alas, he did not have time to release it himself. The details of that very personal period were unclear. It was unlikely that the couple's life was idyllic as they tried to show it. However, their marriage created an image as powerful as their activism and creativity. In June 1980, Lennon chartered a 43-foot sailboat and set sail for Bermuda. On the way, he and his crew got into a storm. Everyone on board was seasick except Lennon. Then John took control and piloted the boat through the storm. The experience breathed new strength into him and his creative muse. As a result, he spent the next three weeks in Bermuda writing and refining tracks for the upcoming album. In October 1980, Lennon came out of the break with the single Just Like Starting Over, and a month later, he and Yoko Ono released the album Double Fantasy. The name came from a flower John saw when he took Sean to a botanical garden in Bermuda. It's a type of freesia, but what it means to us is that if two people picture the same image at the same time, that is the secret. The album included songs written by John on the islands. His music reflected Lennon's satisfaction with his newfound, stable family life. Additional material was recorded for the planned follow-up album, Milk and Honey. However, it, like the autobiographical book, would be released posthumously. On December 8, 1980, John Lennon was killed at the age of 40 while returning from a recording session with his beloved wife to their Manhattan flat. Surprisingly, John's killer turned out to be the man who just an hour ago took his autograph, Mark David Chapman. The police took the distraught fan on the spot, and soon, after numerous assessments by psychologists and psychiatrists, he appeared in court and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Well, if you want to pick it up from the night, um, I was standing there with a gun in my pocket. Knew you were going to shoot him? So, sorry? Knew you were going to shoot him? Absolutely. Okay. Lennon is still mourned all over the world, visiting numerous memorials and making offerings. In 2002, Lennon's hometown airport was renamed Liverpool John Lennon Airport. In 2010, on Lennon's 70th birthday, Cynthia and Julian Lennon opened the John Lennon Peace Monument in Shavas Park in Liverpool. The sculpture, titled Peace and Harmony, displays symbols of peace and bears the inscription, Peace on Earth for the Conservation of Life, in honor of John Lennon, 1940-1980. In addition, John received his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and in December 2013, the International Astronomical Union named one of the craters of Mercury in honor of John Lennon. Lennon's influence, especially on the Beatles, cannot be overestimated. Having revolutionized the sound, style, and attitude of society towards popular music, as well as opening the doors of rock and roll to a wave of young British rock artists, the band spent the rest of the 1960s pushing the stylistic boundaries of rock into what it is today. John's death was a shock to friends, loved ones, family, and fans worldwide. He passed very early without having time to do and say much. We talk about his murder in detail in another video. Why was a talented performer killed? Is it the fault of the FBI? Click on the link and watch to find it out. And this is where our video comes to an end. Thank you for watching it. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. That's how you won't miss our new videos. It was Inco Stories. See you soon.